asked this question a while ago. What stops impulses from going backwards in the nervous system? Because if we had three neurons in a row here, and I stimulate this axon right here with a threshold stimulus, the impulse will go to the right towards the synaptic knob, but it'll also go towards the left, towards the nerve cell body and the dendrites. But we know that there are synaptic clefts, and the synapse only allows the impulse to travel one direction. So that we can't let the, if the dendrites don't release the transmitter, it can't go back and stimulate the next neuron. It can only go one direction. Now that said, and I hate to even tell you this, but there is an exception, and it actually has to do with endocannabinoids. The endocannabinoid, endocannabinoids can actually be released from dendrites and run backwards and stimulate the presynaptic neuron to actually release more transmitter. So, but normally speaking, we don't expect a transmitter to run backwards, right? Endocannabinoids are an exception, not, not the general rule. Something that I call here synaptic delay, okay? synaptic delay. At each synapse, there is some delay, right? The impulse comes in, calcium has to rush to the inside of the synaptic knob, the vesicles have to move over to the membrane, transmitter has to diffuse across, all of that takes some time. It's not much, I don't care if you know how much, about half a millisecond. Would it make sense to you then that one neuron would be faster than three neurons? One neuron would be faster than two neurons, right? If I had a single nerve cell body here with an axon that went way down here, and I stimulated both of these at the same time, this one and this one, does it make sense the single one would get there quicker? Because there's no, there would be no synaptic delay. In your motor nervous system, when you decide to move a muscle, it turns out there are only two synapses in the path, right? At the spinal cord, to stimulate the, what we call alpha motor neuron, we'll learn about later, and at the muscle. So there's not multiple neurons because we want to get the impulse there really quickly, right? You have to get the impulse quick so that you can move quick and respond. So there is some synaptic delay. Types of synapses. You know, I think the, the general impression you probably have is that synapses are always going to be excitatory, but they're not. Some synapses are inhibitory. Maybe because I told you GABA already, right? Uh, but some synapses are inhibitory. That is, they're going to tend to make the next membrane not depolarize. So if an excitatory transmitter is released, we're going to say that it causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential, an EPSP. If an inhibitory transmitter is released, we're going to say that it causes an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, an IPSP. Let's think about the IPSP for a minute, the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So what I'm saying here, folks, let's go back to sleep, look at our synapse. I'm saying that sometimes the transmitter that's being released, when it binds to that next membrane, doesn't cause it to be excited and have an action potential, it causes it to be inhibited and not have an action potential. So like Botox? Botox is actually affecting the release of the transmitter. We'll get to Botox in a few minutes. It's actually something I'll talk about. It turns out that inhibitory transmitters, like GABA, usually work by increasing the movement of chloride ion into the postsynaptic membrane. And inhibitory transmitters usually work by causing chloride ion to move into that postsynaptic membrane. Sometimes they cause potassium gates to open and potassium to leave the postsynaptic membrane, but it's usually chloride that moves in. What charges on chloride? Negative. Negative. So if we were at a resting minus 70 and chloride ion moved in, what would we expect the potential to do? Get lower, right? Or, or, or maybe more, more negative. How about that? 
from minus 70, maybe it goes to minus 80, which means there'd be less chance of sending an impulse, right? The other thing that can happen is that, as I mentioned, sometimes the inhibitory transmitters will cause potassium ion to leave, open up some channels. If potassium leaves, it makes the outside more positive and the inside more negative, also meaning less likely to fire. All right, so uh, it's, it's a stronger polarization, right? It's a hyperpolarization. All right, uh, so that brings us to something that we call synaptic integration. Synaptic integration. Most synapses involve many neurons. So we've been kind of thinking about a, a synapse as being one neuron to the next. Most synapses involve many neurons. Here they're showing two neurons going to one, but there might be 50 going to that one. Okay. So there are, they involve many neurons. Whether or not a postsynaptic membrane has an action potential is dependent upon the sum of the IPSPs and the EPSPs. And so this diagram is trying to, to show you this idea. So here we have an excitatory transmitter from neuron number two. If it fired by itself, it could excite that postsynaptic neuron. But what if at the same time, neuron number one fires and it causes an IPSP? So here we go, we're going to drop from a minus 70 down to a minus 85, and then the EPSP occurs, well, it doesn't get to get to threshold. And so we did not get to have an action potential. And we can, we can do this on a number line. And so I'm going to use a really nasty word here, folks. So watch out, maybe cover your ears. Algebra. So we're going to do some very simple algebra here. It's really just pluses and minuses. So let's say that we have a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts. Okay, this is our, our resting potential. And like this diagram up here, two neurons fire on this neuron at once. One of them capable of bringing the, uh, causing an IPSP by itself of minus 85 millivolts. Okay, so there's our IPSP. Simultaneously, an excitatory uh, neuron fires, and it causes an EPSP, or could cause by itself. Let's go down and say it goes to uh, minus 45 millivolts, okay? an EPSP. And let's say, just for reasons of discussion, that our threshold value is uh, minus 60. Okay? Threshold is minus 60. It's too easy. I'm going to put the, the threshold to minus 65. Okay? All right. So what we want to know is will the postsynaptic neuron fire? Let's do some integration using our algebra. And so from minus 70 to minus 85, what's that net change? Negative 15. Right? And from minus 70 all the way up to the EPSP. What's that net change? We can do this. Plus 25. All right? And so we need to figure out what the net change is. What's the net change? 10. Plus 10, right? A plus 10 minus 15 plus 25 is a plus 10. So now let's go back to our threshold, our resting potential. At minus 70, I'm going to add 10. We're going to get all the way up to minus 60. Did we reach threshold? If threshold was minus 65, we re not only reached, we went beyond. And so in this case, the neuron would have an action potential. So I said, you have 30 trillion synapses in your brain, 30 trillion switches that are firing all the time. And the net result of all that firing is who you are, right? It's what you're doing. Sometimes when um, neurobiologists 
are trying to figure out how the brain works. They model it. They come up with ideas of how it could work. And they know that there's these synapses. And one of the models that's sometimes used, which I happen to like, is to just think of the brain working like a computer. You're looking up at these nice diagrams that are up here on the computer. You know from somewhere that the only reason that nice diagram's up there is that there are zeros and ones, right? There are offs and ons. And everything that your computer does and every display that's up there is simply a matter of a zero or a one, off or on. Everything that you are, everything that you're doing is simply a matter of offs or ons, right? The neurons are firing all the time. Some of them are turning things off. Some of them are turning on. And your net behavior is who you are. So, you know, a few minutes ago I said, this draw your line for the exam, right? And you said, oh, good, I can draw the line for the exam. And then you sat there and you said, you know, it's a really nice day outside. I could probably be outside laying in the sun on the beach right now. And this new material that we're covering is not going to be on the exam. Why don't I just get up and leave, right? Good idea, right? There was an excitatory, right? Neuron saying, hey, do it, go ahead, do it. <laughs> but simultaneously, some inhibitory neurons were firing saying, yeah, but even if it's not going to be on this exam, it's going to be on the quiz a week from Monday. I still need to know the material. I better stay in my seat. And the inhibitory transmitters won. Maybe a couple of people left. But overall, right? You see, we are simply a matter of all these switches going off and on, off and on. And if you change the level of transmitters, you change that behavior. Right? So if we talk about uh, people that are depressed, if we can give them drugs that change the level of excitatory transmitters, it changes their behavior. If you go back 50 years, folks, before we knew about all these neurotransmitters, when somebody had serious depression or schizophrenia or any other mental illnesses, there really wasn't anything we could do. They pretty much just said, okay, take them to the mental institution, lock them up. We can't do anything for them. Now, because we are beginning to understand how the brain works, we can change the level of transmitters and change the behavior.